right, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come back to the AMA. I was here uh, two years ago to speak on the history of gliding in San Diego and Southern California. And um, this is a specific focus on early aviation, but not just in San Diego, but more generally in California. But it all started with this gentleman named John Montgomery, who was flying gliders in the early 1800s in San Diego. I was fortunate enough to meet John Montgomery's great-grandnephew, Craig Harwood, about 10 years ago or so. And he and I decided that it was time someone wrote a book, a biography, a definitive biography of John Montgomery's life. And so together we pieced together this quest for flight book. And I want to take you back to a time a long time ago. Maybe it's not so long ago, it's only about a century ago, when people thought that heavier than air aircraft were completely impossible. That everything we see here in this hall today was completely impossible. And that only lighter than air aircraft, balloons and dirigibles were possible. Clearly no one would ever be able to fly in a heavier than air machine. If you tried, if you even tried, you were considered a crackpot or a crank at the time. And there were people like uh, Joseph LeConte, who was a, a very famous person who helped set up the Sierra Club, who said a flying machine is impossible in spite of the testimony of the birds. And there were other people like Lord Kelvin, who said that heavier than air machines are completely impossible. He also said radio has no future. Wow. There's a guy who wouldn't be a radio controlled enthusiast. I also want to say that California has its own unique history in aerospace. We have individuals in California that are free thinkers. It's what Californians do. And we're very fortunate to have people like Paul McCready and Bert Rutan, who started off their careers in aviation as aero modelers, like many of us, and went on to do fabulous things in engineering and in aerospace for California and also for the nation. So really, through this free thinking style, you can accomplish many things. But society wasn't very kind to free thinkers back in the 1880s, when a gentleman like John Montgomery was trying to think about how to maybe fly. And so here, here is the first kind of person that's actually going to use a model airplane in America to design his own theories about flight. Over time, he's become a forgotten aviator. People don't remember who he was. People don't even know he existed. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that I researching this book that I wrote, I heard in the, in the, in the uh, papers I was reading that here's this forgotten aviator, John Montgomery. Clearly he's re already remembered, but he's remembered as a forgotten aviator. So we took the time to write his story as Quest for Flight to go through all of his accomplishments, not only in aviation, but in science. His story is very important to start with his parents because his parents were very important in his life. And they both came to California in the height of the gold rush. His father, Zachariah, who was trained in law, specifically came to California to make his pile in gold. He wanted to become rich in the gold mines of the Sierras. That was not to be, but at least he was trying. His then-to-be wife, Ellen, came to California at about the same time, settling in Yuba City, and she recognized as a very st a smart businesswoman that she could make a lot more money off of the miners than she could off of mining. So she was there to help supply the miners with goods, she set up a general store and did quite well as a businesswoman in Yuba City. Together they met and they had John Montgomery in 1858. Zachariah was very good in politics as well as law and also very good in, as an orator, as, a, as giving speeches. He became a representative for Sutter County in the California State Assembly in the 1860s and introduced the Montgomery Bill in 1861 because at the time the public education system in California was mandatory as a devout Catholic, he thought he could maybe raise his own children better than the public education system could, and he wanted to do that himself. So he introduced a bill to, to try to do that. He also favored states' rights. States should have the ability to make up their own laws independent of the federal government. At the time, of course, the Lincoln administration was fighting the Civil War, and the southern states were against the northern states. This is a big controversy. He thought it was okay for the southern states to be different if they wanted to be. And he was a very outspoken critic of the Lincoln administration. He set up his own newspaper to espouse his views. A very strong personality and a very strong way of letting the world know about your views. In 1864, the family moved to Oakland from Yuba City. Here's an early picture of John Montgomery as a little, little kid, little baby, with the family and his siblings. He took up his interest in aviation as a youngster at the age of 10, uh, became interested in kites, and a flying top, the kind you would take in your hands and it spins up into the air, that kind of a flying top. I actually saw a few of them for sale here in the expo. But on July 4th of 1869, 
he and his father were inv invited to go to a very important event in California's history. In fact, it's a very important event in the nation's history in aviation. One of Zachariah's friends, Frederick Marriott, had built a dirigible. Now, Frederick Marriott had come, to Engl had come from England to California. He had had experience with dirigibles in England. And he had the idea of a steam-powered dirigible that would carry people aloft. And in order to test his theories, he made a smaller scale version of this called the Avator Hermes Junior. Junior because it was small scale. And he flew it at a place near the San, uh, San Francisco International Airport. It was called Shell Mound Park at the time. And he invited his friend Zachary and his, and, their, and his son John to come witness this event. It actually was the first unmanned powered aircraft to fly in America's history in 1869. And John was thrilled with this. He thought it was amazing that we could have a dirigible that could fly. He went home to build his own small scale model of a dirigible, which didn't fly as good as Frederick Marriott's, but at least he tried. He was making models of things. And at the same time, he finished his primary schooling in Catholic schools in the Bay Area. Now, I'll show you a picture of this Frederick Marriott dirigible. This is the small scale version. You can see the people here. It's pretty big scale, actually, when you think about it. But this was Frederick Marriott's dream, a very, very large, huge steam powered dirigible. And unfortunately, Frederick Marriott passed away before that vision could become a reality. But this was Montgomery's first real significant discovery in aviation that this was possible. And of course, the family grew over time in Oakland. He was the first son, so helping to lead the family. He continued his education. And it's very important to realize that his education was at two very important schools in the Bay Area, Santa Clara College and San Ignatius College both led by some of the expert Jesuit uh, instructors at the time. The Catholic schools in the Bay Area had brought over from Italy some of the best educators to educate their Californians in mainly, mainly things like mechanical engineering, geology because of the gold rush, uh, transportation, railways, that kind of thing. So fluid dynamics, physics, things that you would use for geology. Montgomery was schooled in all of those things. He was recognized as being very excellent in his class by these prominent Jesuit fathers. And he received his bachelor's degree and master's degree in physics, his master's degree only one year after his bachelor's degree. So very well trained in fluid dynamics and mechanics. Directly after graduation, however, uh, the, the family owned a very large plot of land in the middle of Oakland on Telegraph Avenue. If you know Oakland today, you know Telegraph Avenue because it's the main boulevard in the middle of Oakland. And they were right in the center of all of that. Ellen, his mom, decided that this physics stuff is nice, but you really should do something important. We're going to set up a, a grocery store for you on Telegraph Avenue. And you're going to run the store, John, because you're the oldest brother. You're the oldest son. And you're going to run it with your other brother, Richard. There you go. Have fun. Make some money. After all of that schooling. It must have been a little bit contentious for John. John didn't want to run a grocery store. He wanted to do math and physics. So he spent most of his time at the cash register doing equations and making his own theories and not worrying about someone wanting to buy fruit and paying money for it, just lay the money on the table and leave. I want to do my math. The store didn't, didn't do so well at that job. So also at the same time, Ellen experienced some health difficulties. She had asthma. And many of the doctors at the same time said, you should go to the southern climates. You should go to San Diego, where it's natural climate it will help your asthma. In fact. Doctors all over the nation were telling people to come to San Diego because of its nice climate. The San Diego government should have given some nice cash reward to these doctors all around the nation, but they didn't. So the whole family, except for John and Richard, moved down to San Diego to a location just south of San Diego, near Chula Vista, if you're familiar with it, at a location called Otay. And they set up a new ranch there called the Fruitland Ranch with fruit orchards to sell fruit. It was a very, very large parcel of land. John and Richard came later to join the family at the, at the property. And it was very, very remote. This is in, again, near the Mexican border, south of San Diego, about a day's wagon ride from San Diego proper. And in this barn on the property, this multi-story barn, at the very top of that barn, John set up his own laboratory. His father let him experiment with all sorts of different things. He experimented with electricity. He made his own dynamo to make electric current. He experimented with a uh, uh, all the different mechanisms of the celestial orbits, trying to get a gyroscope to match the motions of the planets. And he also experimented with gliders. He was interested in making this aviation thing work and see if he could get that to work. 